Hi. <laughs> that should have been more enthusiastic, right? Yo, what's what's good, everybody? How you guys doing? Yeah, yeah. Are you are you are, are you guys all from Pretoria? No. Who's from Pretoria? Okay. Yeah, he's not sure. He's like, he's 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 still deliberating his citizenship. <laughs> All right, cool. It's good to be in Pretoria, man. We've done uh, three of these. This is the fourth one. You know, we had to take it out the city. Uh, Pretoria does literally feel like, I mean, it is technically another city, but it feels like we like way out. The temperature is slightly different. The air is slightly different. You know what I mean? The swag is slightly different. I'm going to leave that to you guys to interpret. Whether, whether it's better or worse, I'm going to leave that to you guys to interpret. But uh, shout out to you guys for coming through, man. We're officially at hashtag the sit down. Uh, it's brought to you, of course, by Sidestep and uh, Adidas Originals, man. They're the people responsible for making this dope cultural exchange happen. And they're the people responsible for uh, bringing you this lovely lady on my left. Please show some love for Ms. Cosmo. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that mic is on. Oh, oh. Hi guys, there hey. you go. Yeah. Much better. Um, quite excited to be here tonight. Quite excited to share some conversations, have a chat, see what uh, is potting in Pretoria. Um, and obviously just, you know, let's get into the vibe. Let's kick off the weekend in the right way. You know what I mean? A big shout out to Sidestep and to Adidas for bringing me out here quite. Um, I think it's a really awesome uh, concept that we've got going on here. And I was actually speaking to Fred just before we started to say we need to spread the love and get this thing going throughout the country. So hopefully we can keep on sharing it and so not just bring it to Pretoria, but everywhere else. So uh, thank you guys for coming through on a Friday night just to be here with us. For sure, for sure. So before we get into it, I want to know who we have here. Who, who am I speaking to? Am I speaking to... I'm assuming there's rappers, because you, you rappers are everywhere, right? You, you Everybody's I, a, I rapper see a rapper in over there. I can see a rapper. Do we, we probably have a, a producer, I'm guessing, somewhere here, right? A producer. You got the producer hairstyle. There we go. The producer. Yeah. Uh, what what else do we have? Some other kinds of creatives, maybe. Well, what, what, what you got? Events. Okay. Okay. That's that's a good one. We have maybe, we have to have, like, like at least one accountant or financial something. You're an accountant? You're an entrepreneur. Okay. That's that's dope. That's close enough. It's close enough. There's always like that. Every night there's always been like it's like artist, I'm a rapper, I'm a stylist, I'm a, and then one person will be like, "Well, I'm a chef at a four-star uh, <laughs> hotel." Uh, I'm just here, uh, you know, cuz I I registered and I like Adidas. So, okay. So 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 I know who who we're working with. Uh uh, I think, you know, getting straight into the conversation, uh, for anyone who may not know, I'm going to ask you the conventional cheesy interview question just to get us going, right? Um, but so uh, everyone knows you as Ms. Cosmo, the entrepreneur, the DJ, um, you know, you events, I mean, you're a businesswoman, but I know that before you were officially in music, you were in the corporate world. Fred is releasing my skeleton. Yes. yes. No. You were, you were in the corporate. No, I, I only bring it up because I only bring it up because uh, it's something that we spoke about extensively throughout the week, even on in the other sessions. And uh, you know, in the beginning, when you decide that you're going to make the, the the decision to pursue whatever your passion may be, you may not always be in position to just kind of drop everything and be like, I'm going to leave my job, and you know, I'm going to go because these things. Uh, take time. There's a financial investment a lot of times. Um, how, so what, what were you doing before and um, when did you realize that, you know, I'm going to go live my best life? There's a part of my life I wanted to forget. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I can't quite forget four years of my life. That's impossible. But um, I studied at UJ. I did a BCom Finance. Um, and I graduated uh, with a BCom Finance and Investments and that got me into a graduate program at a bank. So I worked, I was in banking for about four years. I was in commercial property finance. 
Um, so basically what that is, is just assisting people who want to purchase properties for business purposes. So uh, industrial buildings, uh, it could be shopping centers, it could be residential buildings that they're going to lease out to a bunch of uh, people who are obviously going to stay there. Uh, so that was my basic nine to five. Um, but how I got into music while I was in corporate um, was something I think that was always kind of inherent in me. Um, you kind of know when you're a creative person, you know when you've got that thing uh, for entertainment, whether it be music, whether it be acting, whether um, you're a chef, as you had mentioned, you know what I mean? So I kind of grew up making compilation CDs. So when I was in high school, um, don't do this anymore. You must buy music. Don't <laughs> don't download and make pirate, pirate music. Um, but that's what I used to do because I guess, you know, it was the thing to do. Internet was still a new thing for us. Um, downloading music, making my own compilations. It got to a point, obviously, fast forward to my being in varsity, I had a car. So it just made it all that more, more easier for me to make those compilations because I could play them in the car, take them to brides, take them to parties. It was always like, you know, the party bus for whenever we needed to go yeah. anywhere. Um, and um, yeah, so that was kind of my thing back then. Then a friend of mine actually, actually suggested uh, when we were on a road trip, um, that friend happened to be Kuli Chana at the time. You didn't know hey, that. Hey, I didn't know that. <laughs> exactly. I didn't know that. Um, it was around the time when Kuli was just getting into his like um, his independence from Murafe. Uh, but he had a show with Murafe uh, and we were going out to Mafike. It was a bit of a road trip situation. And playing the compilations in the car, bumping them. And he's like, yo, man, you know, you've got a really good ear for music. Uh, maybe you should, you know, take up DJing or take up something within the music space. So I kind of sat on it and I thought about it. And I was like, I could he's not, he's not real about this thing, you know. <laughs> um, fast forward a, a bit and uh, I'm in my first year of working in corporate. And at that point in time, I've got a bit of time because I'd started on a graduate program. So when you're graduate program, you're not exactly like physically working um, at that point in time. I was still kind of on the job training. Do you know what I mean? So I had a bit of time in my hands. I was earning a salary. So I was like, okay, well, Kuli said go to a DJ school. Maybe I should try it out. It's a good enough hobby for me to kind of take on at this point in time. So uh, I did um, some DJ lessons at uh, Zintle School Fuse Academy. Um, and at that point, I started getting some support from some of the guys as well because um, I was, you know, when you like things, you kind of know people who are in the industry. So I, um, that was my luck of the draw because I knew people like Dimple, Shake, VG, sp uh, Spare, Names, when they were kind of coming up. Um, and they supported me through this journey because they also understood the necessity for a female in hip hop. And uh, that's when I then kind of took on this thing a little bit more seriously. I was like, okay, well, if the guys are supporting me, then it's better than me going in blindly. And yeah, so I kind of took it from there. I was kind of DJing on the weekend, nine to five, being Monday to Friday, um, which got a little bit taxing to the point where I started on YTKO. Uh, I was one of the first um, YTKO DJs. It was myself, it was Shimza, jo Josie Chave, Jasmo, and DJ Zandi. Yeah. Um, and funny enough, when I went to Fuse Academy, DJ Zandi was my teacher. So everything wow. I know is actually because of Zandi. Shout out Small to world. Um, yeah, so, and he taught me on vinyls, which was, shoo, it was another job on its own. Um, but yeah, so I started on YTKO. With that, I was obviously doing the, the, the weekly mixes, but still doing the nine to five. But being on a platform like YFM kind of gave me that opportunity for people to get to know me a little bit more. Um, so that got me a little bit busier on the weekend, not just playing for like the staff while they're mopping the floors in the beginning. It started, you know, gaining traction, getting me to different places as well. And um, fast forward to when I joined 5FM, because I sent through a demo, I wanted to do a little bit more within the music space, not just play. Uh, so I sent through my demo at the time, and it just so happened that there was an opening. And yeah, that's when I got the stir up on 5FM, and I've been there ever since. It's been a really great journey. And my joining 5FM, I think, got me to the point of, okay, this is getting a bit too busy now. <laughs> um, I was... Like I said, nine to five in Monday to Friday, but then on the weekend I was working and I was also then doing a really late night show because it was still 10 to one at the time. So getting home at 2 a.m., having to wake up at 6 a.m. to get to work at 8 a.m. was just, it was a lot. 
Um, but I was managing it at the time, but I got to a point where I wasn't giving 100% of my energy on either of the professions. Um, work started uh, started slacking a little bit. Radio and, and, and DJing, I don't think I was giving it as much energy as I should have at the time. My brand, I didn't think, was picking up as fast as I needed it to. Um, so yeah, so I got to a point where I kind of had to choose. And having had that four years experience in corporate, I kind of sat back and said, okay, well, if this thing fails, I can always go back because I have the experience and I have the degree. So um, that's not going to fall away at all. And let me just take the chance. And I was young at the time, so it was easier for me to kind of jump ship. And I did. And it was it was a calculated risk, but it was also a very stressful one at the time because uh, being in a stable job, you're always kind of reliant on getting the money at that time of the exactly. month. You know your money's coming in, so you, you, know, you don't have to worry. But like leaving that stability to get into the hustle, completely different ball game. Um, but here I am and I'm surviving it since, so it's been great. Jeez, it's, uh, that's quite the journey. Um, <laughs> hell yeah, show some love for that. I, 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 so we've had this conversation on and off throughout the week with all the other creatives and with your particular experience and the way your journey has gone, I'm curious about what you think about this. Um, so, I mean, whether it be music or, or DJing or any discipline, I mean, art is, um, is, 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 is not necessarily like an academic discipline where it's like you go to medical school like to be a medical practitioner, right? So at, 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 at our core, all of us are artists on some level, even if you, you're not choosing to express it the way that my man Benny here is choosing to express it with music or whatever, right? Do, do you, how, do, how, where do you stand on um, the conversation that, you know, uh, you need a uh, backup or formal training versus people who are self-taught and kind of realize their, their artistic potential, you know, they stumble upon it. You know, I, I you know, Austin had kind of a perspective on it. He was like, man, I, I wish I didn't spend all that money going to school for four years because um, a lot of those lessons I opened up uh, Illustrator and there was a tutorial there <laughs> and uh, I learned you know uh, what I learned over a year in I don't know like a, a 20 minute course you know so as someone who's literally seen uh, both sides of, of both those facets I wonder where you stand on that formal training versus self-taught um, I guess it's a bit of a I'm an in-betweener um, I'm a big supporter in education. I think education is, 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 is very important, especially if you're gonna get into any field. It doesn't necessarily matter what you're in. So if you are gonna get into chef school, then you go to the best chef school. I did a DJ lesson that helped me kind of progress a little bit faster than the next person. Um, taking a course with regards to illustrator, that is still education at the end of the day. You're taking a step to learn something and to skill yourself much better than playing finder finder for an hour do you know what i mean the fact that you're sitting down you're taking the time to read and to learn that's the same as going to a classroom and reading a textbook um, so for me i think getting the basic skills and the basic understanding of any art form is important um, and that just gets you a step ahead than the next person who's going to take their time trying to trial and error and waste more time as opposed to picking up a book so for me, that's what's important. It's not necessarily formal training by going to university, but the mere fact that you're taking the opportunity to understand this thing a little bit better, you know? Right, because I, I suppose education is fluid, right? It's, yeah. uh, especially in 2019, it's not, um, you know, a fixed structure where it was like, you know, 10 years, 15 years ago, and before that, 400 years before that, it was like, if you, wanted to do something, you had to study that thing specifically in a prescribed syllabus, whereas now we have so many educational tools. Um, YouTube is an educational tool. You know, I know a lot of people learn to make beats and stuff like on YouTube or from their friends. So, but, that, um, but that in itself is education. Right. So, so, so for me, that's what is important to me is the fact that you've taken the time to say, I want to learn how to be better at this thing. How can I do that? Where are my resources? The internet is my resource. Let me use it. Um, uh, you're paying for the data, so maybe that's your school fees. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, but at the end of the day, you're still trying a little bit more than the next person who's just going to fiddle with the camera for two hours and not know what they're doing. 
what 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 ways speaking of that what ways if any did your experience in um the corporate world help you when you got to when you got to djing and so um my corporate experience helped me become a professional i think that was the important thing um i find well with myself being in the space that i'm at that i'm in that a lot of creatives don't know how to treat themselves as a brand or treat themselves as professionals they're just like i have talent this is what you're buying into take it or leave it as i am and it's like okay but there needs to be more to that the same way a lot of people say that the, uh, like there's a lot of opportunities and doors opening once you step through that door you still need to maintain that opportunity how do you maintain that opportunity by building yourself to be a brand and i think that those are the little things that i learned how to be professional how to arrive on time how to look the part how to uh, make sure that i present myself in a professional manner make sure that i've rehearsed make sure that i've practiced make sure um, i know how to see, send an email you don't understand how many horrible emails i receive every single day True. people are telling me and they complain to me all the time on twitter ah, i sent a submission hey miss cosmo you're not reading my email well your email doesn't say anything it's just an attachment yeah. how, who am i replying to where is the feedback going what am i saying to this do you know what i mean so little things like that go a long way with regards to getting you to the next step because you need to be able to present yourself in the best way because at the end of, at the end of the day it's the first impression that counts you know no doubt and, and and you've done a hell of a job at diversifying your skill sets um you know radio um you know emceeing um i know you have the the the, the shows that you um started uh sorry the events that you started um um i've been to a couple of those those really cool um was it miss cosmo's house yes it was a fun house fun um, house yeah so i do go. those once a year and i had started she social sometime uh, beginning of well end of last year beginning of this year as well yeah dope so um i want to speak a bit to the plights of these guys um sitting in front of us you are uh, technically an uh, an industry insider uh now now that I, you're I'm on the other side you use, i'm glad you use the word insider and not gatekeeper oh because i'm not a security we, guard we we we're gonna get please. to that <laughs> i'm I, not I've, a security guard i've please. seen the podcast we're gonna get to that <laughs> We're going to get to Fred that. Fred wants a chance <laughs> to get on the pop cars. <laughs> We're going to get to that. <clears throat> yeah, so, so, um, yeah, so speaking of radio, because, I mean, radio has been, I mean, still is the, the biggest and most widespread medium in South Africa. I, I think living in Johannesburg or in Gauteng, um, you know, and having access to so many things, you know, like if you want to, if you want to see Miss Cosmo, you can come to sidestep in Menden on a Friday night. You can go to Taboo if you want to see any number of your um, favorite DJs. You know what I mean? All the big radio stations here, the the, the, the television stations, every, everything is based here, but we underestimate, because we're here, how big radio is. Um, we're, we're also in the internet age, though, right? Um, I think one of the most frustrating things for um, emerging artists right now is that conversation of like, hey, no one, there are no more gatekeepers because the internet is here now. If you want to blow, you can just put your song on SoundCloud and everything will be fine, right? And and obviously, in reality, it's 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 a lot more complex than that, right? Um, you know, you could there, there are a lot of artists kind of working their fingers to the bone, producing songs, staying up all night, um, and then kind of putting it out into the internet and into the universe with no real. Uh, strategy or direction of like how do I how do I from from conceiving this idea and putting this out how is it going to get to um, quote unquote blowing up where, where do you think the radio I'm going to say versus where do you think the radio versus um, the internet um, that lies right now I don't know it's a it's a very faint line but I, I do I do think they can coexist. I'm quite excited about the internet age, if I must be honest. Um, the reason why I'm so excited about the internet age is because it's now forcing the gatekeepers um, to pay attention to what people really want to hear. Um, radio's always been one of those mediums, whether it be radio or TV or whatever kind of traditional media, has always had one person at the helm kind of dictating yes this goes on this doesn't go on that's on high rotation this is on low rotation um, but 
it's as if this kind of suiting to whatever committee of five people decide whether this is a hit or not. Right. And that's still the process that kind of works within the radio space. Um, and for me, as much as that's a good spectrum to kind of work with, um, I still feel like it's kind of lacking with regards to what else could be heard. Because a lot of those people who are sitting in those meetings don't go out to the club. You don't see them on the streets in Brahm. You don't see them what's happening in like the cotton fests of the world. Or You know what I mean? They right. don't go to those types of events. Right which is where internet now comes in because that's now exposing those types of artists who do perform at those events, who do have, um, uh, I don't know, street cred with regards to the fans that they've kind of built. And for me, it's making radio uncomfortable. Yeah. I don't yeah. think it's overtaken radio because unfortunately in the country that we live in, internet is not necessarily as accessible as radio is. Right. Um, but I do like the discomfort it's causing because now we're having to pay attention to people who are saying, oh, well, you're not going to play my song? It's fine. I'll get a million streams on the internet. And then it's like, oh, we have to play yeah. his song now because yeah. he's got a million views. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So from that perspective, I think it's really dope. Whether... Whether you can live on one uh, on one um, platform on its own to kind of be a national star is a different conversation because I think, yes, you can live on the internet and get some buzz and get those million streams, but if you want to get to the grassroots of South Africa and travel and be all over the country, then you need radio for that. What are, what are some of the... I mean, as, as someone who is um, privy to the system and the way that radio works, um, do you have any um, frustrations with with the process? Um, I mean, I mean, you you would know better than us because we because our, we we stand on this side and we go, well, the problem with radio is this, this, and that. Mm -hmm. But as somebody with a 360 perspective on what's going on. You, 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 you definitely have some more, you could definitely shed some more light on how that process can be improved. Um, I guess my biggest frustration, and mind you, now that I've gotten into music production as well, I share the same frustrations or I go through the same process that everybody else does. Just because I work at the station doesn't mean my song automatically goes on the playlist. I also have to go through the same process of submitting, go through the same process of them listening, same process of them telling me, I we don't think it's good enough, or this, that is missing, or one, two, three, four. Do you know what I mean? So I'm in the same space as you're in, so I'm also feeling it from an artist's perspective over and above my having to work in the radio station. So I think what's possibly lacking within that um, that spectrum uh, in the radio space, I think is, is like I mentioned, the fact that the people who are making the decisions are not on the street. So who are you to tell me what's hot right now? Which is why you find some radio stations are either repeating the same song every five minutes, yeah. or um, they are playing old songs that were hits like 20 years ago. Yeah. And you, it's irritating for people to listen to radio because they don't think, well, because the consumers don't feel as though they're playing recent music. So I think that's my biggest problem. And I think it can be improved by getting people who are uh, more inclined to go out or maybe even listening to some of the, 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 the radio jocks to say, hey, this is the next big hit. You need to consider this. Because sometimes they don't even listen to us. Mm -hmm. Like, I can play everybody's song on the stirrup on a Sunday. It doesn't mean it's going to make the main playlist because at the end of the day, it's not my decision, yeah. you know? So I think just the synergy is very important for that to happen. So so if I'm a, I, I'm a emerging artist right now in 2019, and, uh, you know, I'm trying to get my foot in the game, right? What do, what do you think I should do? How do I go about it? I mean, I know that, I, I, I know that, I know that um, information tends to be uh, very general, and that also makes sense because there isn't one prescribed formula that works for every single per, uh, for every single person. You know, we've seen um, come ups in the last five years, ten years, um, come completely differently. A guy like Nasty C, who kind of um, was not relatively known and then he had a hit song overnight and then i mean that's not the real story but he had a hit song over overnight and then he became nasty c and then we've seen guys who've been in the game and visible um for some time and then 
catch fire at some point, build gradually. So um, I, I only ask this because of who we have in, fr in front of us here. And I, it, w what is my strategy um, to make it on, on Ms. Cosmos, <laughs> Ms. Cosmos uh, here today? <laughs> I, you know I had to ask that question. Um, you know I had to ask that look. question. It's difficult because I can't, like you said, I can't map it out because everybody's blueprint is different. Everybody's journey is different. The same way everybody's life is different. So not everybody is going to be an SDC. Not everybody's going to be a Reese. Not everybody's going to be AKA. You can uh, strive to be there, but it's just the way of the world, unfortunately. But it's not to say that you need to give up on your on your hopes and dreams because obviously there's something that you are holding that we might not be hearing that could be the next big thing. Um, so you don't necessarily get like overnight success. Um, things don't work like that. Um, you got to start grinding in some way or, or, or another. And, I, and the common thread that I found with all of the big artists that we have today is that they built their fan base at home. A lot of them... Nasty C coming from Durban built his fan base and created a buzz in Durban before he could build himself uh, a fan base in Johannesburg. True. Uh, MT built his fan base in Brahm before he could build his fan base in the north of Joburg before he could get himself into like a space of ambitious. True. Um, Questa from Gatle Home, aka in Johannesburg North, the, the LES, do you know what I mean? They've all got their fan base that helped them create a buzz. And I think that's the, the basis of what most people need to do. A lot of people just sit back and think, oh, I'll be a studio artist, I'll just make my music and submit it, and this email is going to make fire. That's not how it works. <laughs> you can try, but I mean, it's not gonna get you all the way um, ahead, you know? Um, so I think that's the base for me, is always creating a buzz amongst your peers. From there, then it's a case of starting to make people uncomfortable in different spaces. Then you go to a different area and say, okay, fine. I've created a buzz here. Let me go to the next space. Let me create a bigger buzz there. And then it becomes a word of mouth situation. And that's where most of them kind of created their, their fan bases as well. And, um, and then it's, it's, it, it gets to the discomfort, like I mentioned, where you're on the internet. All your whole fan base that's been following you since since and the next fan base that you've kind of created has created so much buzz on an internet space that now you have to then move on to mainstream and such it rolls over. So someone like Nasty has been working on this thing since he was 13. So everyone looks at him like, oh, this guy blew up when he was 19. Oh my yeah. gosh, he's overnight success. No, he's been, even yeah, though he was too young to be in the club, he was in the club definitely. grinding and waking up and going to school the next day. So it's about how you want to pitch yourself and take it forward. For you to get yourself onto my show is pretty much the same thing. If there's a buzz, I'll listen and I'll I'll listen to other people's opinions. Because sometimes I also don't catch everything. You people also need to understand that I'm getting music from everybody in the country. I've only got one show, once a week, three hours. <laughs> yeah, it's a big show. It's though. a little impossible. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, to get through everybody. So sometimes things like that where you've got the buzz helps me pay attention to somebody that I've missed. Uh, over and above that, I do listen to some, some, some submissions that I get on the emails as well. Um, it is a little taxing because obviously people send stuff nine times out of ten. It, uh, nine times out of ten, it's a... It needs a little work. It's shaky. Which gets me a bit tired <laughs> after some time. But then there's that one person who creates a spark and you're like, oh... There's the star. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's how then I'll get those people who maybe haven't created a buzz, but then I play them on the show because I got a chance to listen to them through the email. So every medium works. Don't 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 sit back and say, I'm just gonna send an email and that's that. Exhaust all of your options. I think that's the important thing. Who who or what has been the most um, uh, exciting discovery that you've made uh, while listening to music? I mean, who's on the scene now that we can kind of reference? You, you, you got their music. <laughs> you, you got their music on an email, or someone played it for you, and the first time you heard it, you were like, "This guy right here, he's sure. that guy." Um, or girl. Or yo, girl. There were. There's a couple. Um, do you know who shocks me the most? Mm. If I must be honest, it's, it's not necessarily the ones who send me music. It's the ones who enter the rap competition I have on my show. Ah. Those ones are the ones where I'm like, yo, 
with you yeah. every week. I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Yeah. Um, so I've got this thing called a rap fact on my show where uh, kids from all over the country send through like a one minute uh, freestyle and um, each week um, we have the, the two contenders and then if the one guy wins, then he rolls over to the next week and he gets to battle the next guy, gets to battle the next guy. And some of the winners on that competition have completely bewildered me. There was a one guy in King Williamstown, there was another guy who was in East London, um, there was the one guy as well in Pumalanga. Um, so for me, those are the guys that I'm always just like, yo, what's happening here? Uh, but the one person that I can mention who I did play before the blow up, before the overnight success, <laughs> was an SDC. Um, he had a song called When's a Mambara. Um, it was a Zulu song, uh, really, really dope song. And I, I think he was 16 at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he was 16 at the time, submitted it, sent it through, and I listened to it. I was like, oh, okay, this is a really dope song. And then obviously that's when I started hearing a little bit more about him. He also did a song with Junior De Rocca before he did Truth Back. He actually even recorded like, a, like an intro for my show. Um, and he had sent it to me, but I didn't find it. Like, I think I only found it like years later after, <laughs> after I held no. I was like, oh, sure. <laughs> I yeah. should have played it back then. Look yeah. now. But... Um, yeah, he's the one person who I can sit back and say, you know, I played him before the hype, and I think that's why we have such a great relationship today. Super fire, super fire. Maybe you'll find one of one of those guys here today. Who knows? I hope so. <laughs> you know what I mean? We need we need new blood. I mean, the last time we had someone like really dope come out, I think was possibly like, I think Shane Eagle was the last like, yeah, big you know, yeah, internet star. So we need more fresh blood. Please, guys, give us give us the juice. So um, um, I'm interested in your thoughts on this. So uh, the way I look at this, um, I think, you know, so, so some people have diff differences with this. So the conversation around, and you touched on it earlier when you said, um, you know, start with your hood, start with your surroundings and your immediate environment, right? I feel like that the, the, the word environment in 2019 doesn't, necessarily doesn't exclusively um, include your physical environment because whereas if you were growing up in the 90s your your environment what you're exposed to were the people who you interacted with on a daily basis um, physically right today people are literally growing up on the internet so their environment is not necessarily geographic Right, so we're consuming information at the same rate and even at the same time as someone who is in Paris in a different time zone, or in Washington, you know, or in Nairobi, um, and I think that's had a big um, influence on the music that we hear coming out of South Africa. Right, there are kids um, who, you know, we, we've heard people say things like Nasty C or a Shane Eagle doesn't sound, you know, quote unquote South African, and I guess that. A lot of that refers to um, maybe not having the, the like linguistic tropes. You know what I mean? Oh, you don't rap in vernacular. Or there's nothing. When I listen to your song, there's nothing that uh, uh, suggests or indicates that you are from KZN or you are from wherever, right? Um, and I wonder, I wonder where where you stand on 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 that. I personally think it's a it's a positive thing. There's 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 a lot of positives because we are living in a in a in a in a global community now, right? So people aren't necessarily making music just for their friends or just for the people in the hood. They're like they they're looking at their audience as a global audience, right? So if I make my song, man, when I put it out, I I do want. Uh, Benny from down the road to be able to listen to it and resonate and relate to it but also if someone in Atlanta catches on to it you know I need them to be able to you know what I mean feel it the same way that my homie in my neighborhood um, um, feels it so I, I wonder where you, where, where you stand on that I know there's a school of thought as well who are like our, our music is being imported uh, sorry exported uh, the, the, the eyes of the world is on Africa and South Africa so when you're somewhere else across the world you know, you need to represent and people need to be able to go, this guy's from there, this guy's from Niger. What, what do you think? Um, okay, you've asked me two questions. I'll answer the first one, which is um, building your, your fan base uh, on the internet. I think it's important to use whatever platforms work for you. 
if it's the internet, then let that work for you. If it's, I don't know, performing at the local tavern, then let that work for you. At the end of the day, you need to build your fan base however resonates with you. And I like the fact that you're saying that you could build a fan base on the internet and have somebody in the States as well as in Katle Hong at the same time because that is the age that we're living in. But don't let it just live there. I think a lot of people get too comfortable being on one platform. And that's the buzz, the extra buzz I'm trying to say you need to create. Because yes, you might have put a song out. Yes, you might have had... I don't know, 10,000 downloads on Data File Host, but find those 10,000 people who downloaded the song. Create an event or uh, ask to perform for free at an event where you know you'll find those 10,000 people to interact with them because what happens is those people see you perform, what do they do? They grab their phones, they record you, they upload it. You've now created uh, word of mouth. You've now created a buzz with their people who are following them who never followed you before. You're still on the internet, but it's now circulating into a bigger circle. Do you know what I mean? So for me, I think it's very important for people not to just feel like, okay, I've uploaded SoundCloud, do your thing. Let's work whatever... Um, uh, avenues that we have to grow this thing into a global platform uh, to the point where people become so uncomfortable that they need to listen to the song. Um, with regards to it going internationally and then representing South Africa, I am a, I am a believer that um, South Africans need to rep us the way um, that we need to with regards to Vinak and things like that because at the end of the day that is our identity, that is our culture. I understand the likes of uh, Shane Eagle and Aries and, and Nasty who rap in English. And if you speak to them, they're not necessarily saying that they don't know how to. It's just how they relate to the genre. And there's nothing wrong with it. I think what's important is that even in the content, it needs to then resonate with South Africa. So the whole verse can be in English. But if you feel it and you listen to it and it sounds South African, that's what's important. Um, and... Um, I think a lot of people kind of misconstrue that because they always sit back like, ah, but you don't represent us the way. But then why is he getting so much buzz internationally True. if he's not... True. If he's not representing South Africa. True. Do you know what I mean? Um, yes, we might sit back and say the only way is if you rap in, in Zulu. But maybe you also do... Why does AKA transcend throughout the country? He raps in English. It's because he has South African nuances in his music to still make you feel like you're in the Gassi, even though you're rapping in English. So I think that's what the, the, the important thing people also need to understand is yes, rep your country, because I think that's the important thing. We don't really have an identity in the rest of the world. People are like, okay, Nigeria does Afro beats, Angola does, um, does bongo, Tanzania's got their own thing in Swahili. Where does South Africa sit? We've got so many sounds. Mandela. Mandela. But, okay, and we all love Mandela, Mandela but sound. can we move on as well? Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> What is our sound? We've got so many sounds coming from South Africa. Nobody knows who we are. There's Chrome, there's my piano, there's Kwaito, there's Vanek rap, Vanek rap that's got Twana, it's got Zulu, yeah. it's got Kosa, it's got Afrikaans. Do you know what I mean? To, like to, to, to be fair though, we do have 11 official languages and, exactly. and, and we're very multifaceted. It's very difficult. Yeah. So, yeah. For, so for, that's why I come back to saying South African nuances. Yeah. And there's certain things that that combine all of our all of our nationalities together. Most definitely. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And those are the things you need to kind of then make sure that you sound South African by portraying that in your music. Most def, most def. Um, I want to uh, open up. We're having a really good conversation here. I want to open up um, the conversation to you guys. I know there's some inquiring minds here who maybe have some questions or comments. This is a safe space. Um, you know what I mean? If you want to ask Miss Cosmo something. Yeah, okay. Tell us what your name is and go. My name is Granddaddy. Ooh. Yeah, I'm How much were your chains? <laughs> Granddaddy. Yeah. Granddaddy. Ooh. How did you get your rap name? Um, I'm always interested in rap names. Please tell I, me. I have my granddad's name, so. <laughs> Granddaddy. I dig <take> you. Omuntuga <laughs> Koko, aka Ubabaga Daddy. <laughs> AKA Umama Ati Daddy. Ebo! I got an easy challenge, I'm easy to was a matala was. Okay, but yeah. So, yeah, my biggest question is 
how do you penetrate promoters because they are the ones that are putting us in the club they are the ones that are giving us more hype and they never want to listen but for no crazy so do we have to grease or is there a way no no i'm 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 completely against greasing by lack of a better phrase payola um i'm completely against it because i don't think you need to pay someone to convince them you have talent if you have it they're going to find you and they're going to make sure they pay you what you're worth to put you on that stage so i'm completely against payola um i think to get their attention is completely different um i guess the attention comes in with how you 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 spread your your the message around your music and i guess it's that it's that back to that creating the fan base conversation um with regards to promoters are difficult i won't lie even sometimes i struggle so um that's a bigger beast on its own but i guess it's also just creating the hype to the point where they need to pay attention to you um over and above that be at every event I think also people need to see you because sometimes people forget if they don't see you. So you need to be in the club, you need to be at the events, you need to be a, a supporter. They need to see you everywhere to be like, "Yo man, you're always here. What do you do?" Or maybe even if they don't ask you, maybe you also then make it known that you, this is who you are, this is what you do. Um and you know, at some point you'll get your opportunity. You just need to make sure that you're present, you know? Oh, hello, hello. Uh, my name is Umzu. I work as a compliance officer at a uh, investment bank. Uh, well, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> But I've always uh, had a passion for music. I used to produce back in 2004 and now that I'm close to 40, I kind of feel like I want to do it again. But uh, my main concern and my main question revolves around content and uh, how explicit can we actually push the boundaries in South Africa. Uh, there was a time when they made the paintings of um, Mshinwam, you remember the Zuma stuff? I, I felt that it, it made an impact, right? It, it got us to wake up and focus on what actually is happening in the country. Now, when it comes to our lyrics, or when I actually uh, recite my lyrics to some of my friends, they're like, oh, why did you say that? Why did you mention cocaine? Why did you mention that? You know, and stuff like that. So I'm like, okay, how am I going to get you to get the message if I'm always sugarcoating everything? So from your experience and you um, combing through the music that you're going to be putting out on your platform, how, what, what is your stance on that with, uh, with regards to how far we can push the envelope to get the picture across and the emotions invoked? Sure. Um, I think oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a personal choice at the end of the day. I think people need to decide how far of a boundary they want to push. Some people like to play it safe. Other people like to get right into the nasty. You know what I mean? Um, and I guess it, it, it's all on your brand. It's all on your, 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 your message. Because I wouldn't be able to recite your message the way you can do it. I think that's basically how we can kind of take it. Because at the end of the day, Everybody can be vulgar. Everybody can kind of say what they need to say. You choose how far you want to take it. You can literally say the F word five times in one verse. If that's what makes sense to you, then that's what makes sense to you. You know what I mean? Molwini. I come out Lolo Vandal. And I ask you, does it mean that you have a life and you have a life? Or do you have a life? Okay. Fred, can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is a, like a great initiative. Have you ever thought of like um uh, picking up like that one guy or artist, whether it's a male or a female, with potential and say, okay, I'm gonna take you to that spe- specific gig and perform with you, maybe like before you play your set. Yeah, boy, and then you're like, okay, no, when you open your set, you're just going to perform and then you disappear. Is, is that possible? Um, I have thought about it. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do because uh, you also need to understand the type of artist that you're trying to introduce. You need to also then make sure that you can manage them as an artist. So that gets into basically like a whole artist management conversation. 
That's a lot of work, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of money. I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm not saying I would never do it. I have considered it. I've just maybe haven't known how to structure it to work with my sets. Because at the end of the day, it needs to work with my sets. Uh, but I think there will come a time where I can get to it. Um, and yeah, we'll see kind of where we can take it and where we can go. And just uh, just a bit of a shout out to Lolo because he's busy acting coy here in the corner. Um, but remember the rap, the rap competition I mentioned on my show? He was the first winner of the rap competition that I had on the store of. Um, and he's been pushing his music ever since. And I appreciate the fact, I appreciate the, 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 the drive that he has because from that competition, he, it gave him the drive for him to uh, leave King Williamstown, come to Johannesburg, push himself. He got himself on the lineup for Back to the City at some point. Um, and he's done a lot of stuff for himself and pushed his brand. So big ups to you. And Thank you. for still coming through to, to an event like today. I, I also got to, I know this is not the Lola show, but I also got to shout him out because he probably has the record for uh, the artist who has been on the Hype mixtape the most times. Five d times. D d during my tenure there as, as editor. So, yeah, shout out. That, that, that's a good case study for a lot of what we're, we're talking about and discussing today. Uh, do we have uh, other comments, questions? Um, or oh, you guys just here to play your music. You're not playing around. I, I can see it in your eyes. I can see it in your eyes. You, you guys are not playing games. We have, okay, we have a question or a comment right there. Um, thank you for this opportunity and having us. Um, my question is to you, Ms. Cosmo. What's your name? My name is Beta, sorry. Um, my question is, is there actually a requirement for a song to be played on radio besides it being explicit? Um, firstly, I don't play explicit music. It's radio. <laughs> We're not even allowed the N-word. That's how bad it is. Um, there are no specific, specific requirements. I think it just needs to have the right sound with regards to mastering, mixing. Sometimes a lot of people, uh, because we're in the internet age, a lot of people think that they can do these things on their own. There's nothing wrong with that. You just need to be able to have a team to help you or somebody else who has studied sound engineering to help you master your song. Uh, so sometimes that's why some songs get rejected because the mastering is incorrect, the mixing is incorrect, the vocals are badly put in. Little things like that can already get you a decline with regards to your song being on radio. Um, but over and above that, um, yes, if you send me an explicit song, I can't play it on the radio. It needs to be a radio edit. A lot of people send me explicit songs and expect me to just play it like that. No, make a radio edit. Um, that's why the term radio edit exists. But over and above that, I think if your song is good enough and you've basically mastered it correctly for it to be audibly correct for a platform, maybe it's even like iTunes, because they even check to make sure that it's mastered correctly before they put it on their platforms then you should be good to go. Um, hi, my name is Benicio. Uh, I just, I don't have any questions because I've, I've been watching the podcast. So <laughs> while she's speaking, my mind is like breaking down everything else I've spoken about. So I'm like, oh snap, <laughs> that thing's like school. <laughs> so yeah, I just wanna say thank you for the podcast and just keep going. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Uh, okay, cool, man. So uh, now um, we're going to get into this, the, the, the segment that I, I can see the fire burning in some of your eyes right now. I could, I could see it from a mile away when I was walking down the corridor and guys were just, there was someone who was just pacing like this. And I know that look and I know that, I, and I know that walk because I've experienced it so many times in my life. I know what's coming next. Can you listen to my mixtape? And I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I want you to know that. I'm with you. I see the vision. I know there's a couple guys here who sent us, who sent us music. Um, there are a couple guys here who brought music with them. Uh, you know, Miss Cosmo is here. She's got that discerning ear. Um, you know, so if, if uh, by show of hands, um, any of you guys brought that music with you? Or uh, Lucas? Is Lucas here? Lucas, do we, do we have some of that music uploaded? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. You guys down to 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 jam? You guys Ooh, down to we jam? Got we're gonna play. party happening we, we, in we, Pretoria. We, you know what I mean? We're gonna turn this up, and uh, you know we're gonna play your song. So basically, um, bring out your phone, 
Um, if you want to play something, we'll jam it, and maybe Ms. Cosmo will be kind enough to, to give some feedback. Uh, maybe, you know, some feedback, some pointers on how you can improve it. In the meantime, while we set that up for a few minutes, uh, you guys are welcome to help yourselves to some waters and Red Bull um, at the back. Uh, yeah, we'll be set up in a few, and we can get this going. Cheer. Cheer. Cheer.